Hello ladies and gentlemen and a very warm welcome indeed to today's webinar which is brought to you by Shared Services, link.com and sponsored by ESCA. I'm very pleased that over the next 60 minutes we're going to be looking at uh, benchmarking KPIs specifically pertaining to your accounts payable world. So um, before we go into how the uh, next hour is going to work, I'd like to present our guest speaker, uh, Julie May, who's the Business Development Manager at ESCA, has been with ESCA for five years and has really been in the process automation world uh, for 20 years. And um, some of the companies that she has been helping with process automation um, really over the last five years are companies like 3M, Ecolab, um, many of the top 100 hospitals in North America and also at GE Healthcare. So we're really going to be drawing on Julie's experience over the next uh, 60 minutes. So the format for the next 60 minutes is as follows. Um, you have been asked over the last 24, 48 hours to go and do some homework in advance of this session, really uh, gather together um, the KPIs um, that are most important uh, to you that reflect really uh, where you are in your accounts payable function. Um, so what we're going to be doing is um, I'm going to be handing over to Judy shortly and one by one, we're actually seven KPIs that we're going to be focusing on. Um, she's going to be starting off with each, with each chapter, if you will, um, looking at the importance of why we're talking about that KPI, then we'll be running a live benchmark, and then we'll be um, actually comparing the findings of um, the live benchmark with it, the industry benchmarks that uh, ESCA has been gathering uh, with the help of Shed Service Link.com over the last um, few months. So you'll really see how you compare with other organizations on the webinar today, but also be able to compare yourself with industry metrics gathered by analysts too. So um, your input doesn't stop there. Um, we will take 10 minutes at the end of this session for you to put your um, questions through to Julie. So that might be specifically on how you might be able to improve your KPIs or how you might continue to, to gather some of those KPIs. So um, how that works is you've got a, a box which I've highlighted here um, and you've all got that on your screen. Uh, submit the question to me nice and early. The sooner you get it to me, the earlier, um, the more chance it is um, that I can put that to Judy in the last 10 minutes of this webinar. So do take me up on that offer. It's always a great way to get um, your questions answered. So as far as the context for today's webinar is concerned, many of you will be running shared services organizations. Your shared services organizations that have a considerable scale, and what we, what we mean by that is you have high invoice volumes. Um, and it's really your responsibility to make sure that the accounts payable processing, the processing of purchase invoices is as elegant and as seamless and as automated and timely as it can be. So it's your responsibility within the finance world to be really looking at continuous improvement. Um, and one tool to really further improvement and also to track the, the progress made within that improvement path is benchmarking data. So um, you'll probably be hugely aware that when you moved into the world of shared services, you probably gathered your baseline data and you've been probably comparing it um, kind of quarter by quarter or, or maybe more frequently ever since, really comparing it back to that baseline. Um, and, um, and it's really important for shared services organizations in particular to, to have that history of data, but also be able to compare with other shared services organizations in industry, but also outside industry, um, to really make sure that they are um, as competitive as they can be, and they are as good as they can be. So it's really, really important for a shared service organization to make sure um, that they have access to uh, really good benchmarking data, and not just benchmarking data that they've gathered internally, but benchmarking data from external 
uh, representing external companies as well. If you layer on top of that as well, the whole discussion around um, that benchmarking data needs to be meaningful. There are some benchmarking stats which are really quite interesting, you know, in, in an isolated fashion, but they really just tell you one bit of the story. There are other um, benchmarking bits, benchmarking data or KPIs, which um, really are much more meaningful, and we're going to be drawing on some of those over the next um, the next hour. So what we are doing is focusing this webinar on the chief KPIs that are really used to drive improvement in AP. And some of them that you'll be very, very familiar with, and there might be a couple in there which are a bit of a surprise to you. Um, so now I'd like to introduce Julie May from ESCA. Over to you, please, Julie. Uh, hello, Susie. Uh, nice to join you today. And just wanted to do a couple housekeeping items as far as the social world goes. Um, Esker has become more and more involved in the different social media that's out there, and we would invite you to join us as we're going to actually have this conversation going on Twitter as well. And the hashtag for the webinar is Quit Paper. And we'd also like to invite you to join us for the latest insights and webinars and upcoming events, as well as some interesting blog articles that we have available. And that um, is available at, at, at Esker Inc which is at E-S-K-E-R-I-N-C, and also available on our website, which is www.esker.com. Um, love the fact that you describe the AP process as the possibility of being elegant, Susie. And um, elegance is something that we don't typically hear in the world of efficiency and automation. But as far as Esker goes, um, might be helpful to give you a brief overview of kind of who we are and why we feel so strongly about the topic of helping organizations. And really our mission in just a couple words is to be able to help organizations quit paper. But it's really much more than that. It's really about automating those manual intensive processes that still exist within the organizations. And I guess to uh, get to a point of elegance would be the goal. Um, we actually have global offices. so. The North American headquarters is in Madison, Wisconsin, but our worldwide headquarters is in Lyon, France. And we also have other regional locations across Europe and Asia. Our company itself has been in business for over 24 years. We actually started off as a terminal emulation company um, and moved then into faxing and document automation. And we've been recognized by Gartner, IDC, and other analysts as a key player in the market for document process automation. Um, and as Susie had mentioned, we help some really well-known companies out there to automate different business critical processes, companies like Microsoft, Whirlpool, um, 3M, and others. And we're also a global player as far as looking at these technologies go, as far as they go. So when you're looking at these things, um, having a presence in your office that is the location of your shared service center, as well as having somebody from Esker available in the area where your headquarters is can be a real benefit to organizations. Um, one other note that's a little bit unique to Esker is that we have been in the cloud for over eight years, and we also offer that same functionality as an on-site offering. But I know that there's a lot of discussion about things that are in the cloud these days. And um, being that we've had this kind of breadth of experience, which eight years doesn't necessarily sound like a long time, but when you're looking at a lot of the organizations that are offering cloud solutions these days, um, many of those organizations are quite young as far as the overall age of the organization. But also, they've just recently been able to kind of make that leap to have their functionality available as a service as opposed to an on-site offering. And we've actually been doing that for eight years. So we've got a lot of knowledge in that space and a lot of bandwidth. Um, as as far as the webinar itself goes, wanted to let you know that in this webinar we're going to be covering a few main topics, as Susie had mentioned, as well as then moving on to a Q&A. So the benchmarking, moving into how your key KPIs stack up against other things that are out there and other organizations out there, and then successful criteria and success factors that you can utilize when you're looking to improve your KPIs. We'll talk a little bit about a case study for an organization, move on to the question and answer portion. Um, as far as that first topic goes and the imp importance of benchmarking, 
basically, when you start looking at that, the importance of benchmarking is that you can't manage what you can't measure. And I know we've heard that so many times, but it's really the truth. And keeping that in mind, there's two other points that we talk about with benchmarking. The first is that you want to align the appropriate KPIs with your organizational goals. So when your organization puts out their goals for the upcoming year, you want to be able to make sure that the KPIs are things that you're measuring that align with those specific goals from an organizational standpoint and then also as a departmental standpoint. The second item is making sure that you're using that consistently over time and that they should be evaluated as well over time. And so when you're looking at those things, um, as the goals of your organization might change or be tweaked, you want to make sure that your KPIs are still in line with the organizational goals and the departmental goals that you're working towards. So it's that combination of having a consistent evaluation over time so you can see improvements or areas where things might be starting to dip but also having the agile or agility to be able to know when a KPI might be something that you've been measuring but is maybe no longer the key indicator for something within your organization if your goals have changed. So it's kind of walking both sides of that line to make sure that they have meaning and that they're also things that are of use to your organization when reaching your goals. As we move into the next portion of the webinar, we're going to start talking about kind of how your KPIs stack up and how those things um, are measured. So when we're talking about these things, we want to first move into kind of a context question. And the context question that's going to be asked really is talking about the quantity of documents that you're processing with your, in your organization. And how you can achieve some big wins by being able to um, look at these things in the right context with your organization. And Susie, I'd like to hand it over to you for that first live question. Thank you very much indeed, Julie. So coming up on your screens now, and as Julie mentioned there, this is a context question. So we really know the, um, the landscape in which we're actually doing that, that kind of like-for-like -like comparison. How many invoices do you process Per annum. You, this is basically coming, the invoice is coming into your shared services world. So when you were gathering all of those KPIs, what was the, the volume of invoices um, you were actually um, basing that, that data on? Was it less than 100,000 a year, 100,000 to 200,000 invoices per annum, 200,000 to half a million per annum, half a million to a million invoices per annum, or more than a million invoices coming into your shared services organization or fi centralized finance operation? each year. And remember, ladies and gentlemen, this is um, all third-party invoices coming in in an electronic format, EDI format, um, uh, paper format, etc. So all of the invoices coming in from third-party suppliers each year. Only 54% of you have responded. This is a benchmarking webinar, so if you haven't already responded, please do so. Closing the poll in three, two, one. Let's have a look at the results coming up on your screen now. So 61% of you voted. Um, now, interestingly, a third of you actually have less than 100,000. Um, and I think what that tells us is that the, the kind of the, um, the organizations that have less than 100,000 in the past m might not have been looking at kind of serious process improvement or um, shared services or really looking to be aggressive in their process automation, and now they really are. So I think that's quite telling of where the market is right now. It's not just the kind of the really large enterprise organizations that are looking seriously at improving their accounts payable purchase to pay organization. It's really um, um, companies with kind of 50,000 to 100,000 invoices per annum too. So a third of you with less than 100,000, um, and that's probably uh, another third, about 36%, with half a million or more. So really a third, a third, a third there. So um, interesting results. Back to you, please, Julie. Thanks. And yeah, just to add to that, one quick note is that as we talk about moving to the cloud, that's one of the things we see is that it's easier for companies to be able to automate because it has such a smaller price of entry 
as you're moving things forward and looking at you know those smaller quantities um, makes it more possible for organizations. Now we're going to move into that first KPI question and the first KPI question is going to have to do with documents processed per employee and this really has to do with kind of how efficient your process is and being able to talk about kind of the bandwidth that a certain employee is able to handle within your organization. And Susie, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you to ask that question. Thank you, Julie. So coming up on your screen now. So um, how many invoices do you process per full-time employee per annum? So uh, when we were sending you the homework, we were asking you to take um, all the people in your AP function to, to use in, in the maths for this, um, so not just the keys. And I think that's a really Im important uh, statistic um, or, or kind of consideration to, to bear in mind. Um, how many invoices do you process uh, per full-time employee per annum? Is it less than 9,000 per annum per FTE? Uh, 9,000 to 15,000, 15,000 to 25,000, 25,000 to 33,000, or are you in the, the range of 33,000 invoices per FTE per annum or more? Only 49% of you have responded. We do like to get these responses up to about 70%, please. So um, if you haven't done your homework and actually got the stats in front of you, uh, please um, provide a, a um, a very, very good, strong, well-backed estimation. Um, we will accept those too. So uh, we're at 60% of you responding. So let's close this now, um, closing the poll in three, two, one. 62% of you coming in there. So coming up on your screen, you'll see the results. And what we're going to be doing, so once we've um, gone through this, I'll be handing back to Julie, and Julie will be ma really making a comparison between these results and the results that the analysts um, have been sharing over the past uh, 12, 24 months. So you can see here that 27% of you are coming in at less than 9,000. So just re remember that figure, 27% uh, of you less than 9,000. And going right up to the other end of the spectrum, we've got 17% of you at 33,000 uh, 33, invoices per head per annum or more. So um, uh, quite a, a, a good proportion of you um, in the 33,000 or more. So without me going in, back into any more information there, I'm going to now hand back to Julie for, for comment and then a comparison really with the, the benchmarking data that we've got. Excellent. Thanks, Susie. Um, when I'm looking at the pro poll responses versus kind of those best in class, what we're going to see is that those first two respondents where it's less than 9,000 and less than 15,000, those are organizations where you know a single employee is processing about 1,500 or less invoices per month, if I'm doing my math all correctly there. And that's 54% of the respondents. So over half of the organizations are having um, you know, less than 1,500 invoices that are being processed per employee, which is something that we see, but it's something that we see that can be significantly improved upon. And if you can move really from that upper column to the lower column, you're able to actually intake your productivity by your employees and increase it by you know, three times what it had originally been, which is an interesting thing to think about as far as kind of the money that would be able to be saved as well as what you could do with that extra time with those employees. Um, when we start to look at the industry metrics, what we see is that the best-in-class organizations are up at about 32,000 invoices per annum that their processes are able to handle, which is approaching that number of you know about 3,000 invoices per month, a little bit less than that. When you start to look at kind of the non-top performers, you're looking at about 9,000, so you're starting to approach 1,000 invoices per month. But when you look at the companies and organizations that have not automated at all, they're around the 6,700 point, which you know is around. 500 invoices, a little bit more than 500 invoices per month per employee. And you start to look at how big of a number there is between that bottom number and the top number. And obviously there are some areas there that um, organizations can make a significant impact on their costs. But also if you're able to move within those stratas, you're able to 
take advantage of some other value-added things that you can start doing as an organization and can start you know, really being a true partner to your suppliers and can then have some conversations with them about other things related to your purchasing relationship with them so that you can look at you know, discounts, lower prices, things of that nature. Susie, with that, I think we can move on to the third question. And with sure. that, so sorry, the, um, the I was just going to say, I forgot to give my little <laughs> intro there, so let's do that. Um, forgot about this. How, how much does each invoice cost to process? And when we're talking about that, really it's looking at another way of kind of measuring productivity or what your cost is within your organization to be able to make the move from a uh, less automated system to a more automated system because as you're doing that, your cost for each invoice should really start to drop significantly. And that's one good measure of being able to start to compare what your ROI will be when you start looking at some of the different solutions that are out there and to be put into place. And uh, Susie, now I think we're ready for that next question. Perfect. So. Um, Let's launch a poll to find out from you how much it costs uh, for you to process each invoice. So again, just going back to the, the kind of taxonomy, if you will, that we provided when we were asking you to do your homework for this. Uh, we were talking about all invoice types. So this is PO, non-PO, and all um, invoice formats, so uh, paper, um, OCR, um, data captured, electronic, um, so all different types of um, transmission, if you will, transmission types, and all types of invoices, PO, non-PO, so just to boil down to what the average is. Is it um, less than $2 per transaction? Uh, just over $2 to $4 per transaction, $4 to $7 per transaction, $7 to $14 per transaction, is it $14 or more per transaction? So, um, and just to be clear as well, this is from the receipt of the invoice into your, into your business, be it at the business unit or the shared services organization, through to the payment of that transaction. So what we're not including here is the cost of raising a purchase order. Right, fifty-five percent of you have voted. If you haven't already done so, please do so, and be closing the poll in three, two, one. Let's have a look at the results coming up on your screen now. Sixty-four percent of you responded there, so thank you for that. That's our um, that's our our best so far. So it's nice to see um, a bit of a, a pyramid going on here, which is top heavy. Um, in that 27% of you actually have said that you're coming in at less than uh, $2 per transaction and only 2% of you are coming in at $14 or more per transaction. Um, and uh, if we look at that, that's about 60% of you are in the middle with the, uh, with the $2 up to $7 transaction. So interesting results. Back to you please, Julie. Great. Thank you. And as far as that goes, it's kind of interesting to take a look at um, the answers from the last question and the answers from this question because it's um, giving some interesting thoughts as far as you start to look at your organization and kind of that cost per transaction versus the number of documents that a single person can process in a month. Um, when you're looking at these type of things, um, getting to less than $2 is obviously kind of the goal and some organizations I've seen have even been looking to get um, you know, to a smaller amount than that that they're starting to um, put into dollars and cents. And the kind of group that is in the $4 to $7 range is a pretty sizable percentage. So when you're looking at 27% of organizations being in that range, um, you know, that's an area where you've got some significant room of improvement if you go from $2 to $7, or I should say the other way around, from $7 down to $2, um, you're able to kind of cut those costs potentially in half or even more than that, depending upon which end of the, edge of the range you're at with the 4 to $7. Now, if we're going to take a look at kind of best-in-class documents and best-in-class information for processing invoices, when you're looking at those top-performing service centers, they're in that $2 range. 
when you're looking at the average, the $7 range, and the bottom at the $14 range. Now, the interesting point is that kind of our respondents here, we had a 2% group that was in the 14 or more dollar range, and yet we see that really kind of that bottom performing group in the overall metrics can be there. So one thing that we always do talk to organizations about is making sure that um, when you're looking at the total price of processing an invoice, you want to take into consideration everything in the process, not just things that are maybe, you know, very obvious and easy to measure. The other thing is when you're looking at your overall metric and your overall dollar amount, make sure that, you know, your measurement is accurate and how well can you actually measure that with the um, functionality and reporting capabilities and the things that you have available to you within your organization. And I know that there are some great tools out there um, that are available on a number of different websites and a number of different organizations um, offer them to assist with, you know, kind of getting that true measurement of your cost savings. I know that there's some consultants out there that are available as well. Um, so kind of having that overview, we're able to move on to the third benchmark item, which is how many invoices did you have that might have had the option of being um, automatically processed? And this is looking at, you know, the number of invoices that you have that really matched on the first time through and didn't require um, any sort of um, special handling as far as sending things out for approval because there was no goods receipt or because the um, approval of the purchase order wasn't complete or maybe there was no purchase order at all. So these are those documents that come in and can just be entered straight into the system and could have been good candidates for automatic processing. And Susie, um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Judy. So coming up on your screen, you can see the um, benchmark number three question. So what is your percentage of invoices that match first time? So what we're talking about here is Judy was mentioning there, is really the invoices that either match with the purchase order um, or match with the PO and the goods receipt note. Um, and the purchase order has actually been um, uh, provided before the event, i.e. Um, provided at, before or at the time of purchase rather than after the time of purchase. So, and as Judy was mentioning there, these really are the transactions that if you automated would be straight through um, straight through transactions. So uh, are you at 91% of your transactions or more first time match, 85 to 90% first time match, 70 to 84% first time match, 60 to 69% first time match, or are you at 59% or less of your invoices actually first time match, which would suggest um, that uh, about 40%. Uh, 41% of your transactions are what you would classify as an exception, have some kind of in inquiry or um, exceptional process to support them. But 63% of you responding, so again, let's see if we can uh, beat our best yet, which I think was 64%. Um, so if you haven't already responded, please do so. Close in poll, ladies and gentlemen, in three, two, one, we're at 66%. So coming up on your screen now, I'm afraid to say we have a, a pyramid with us, but it is the other way around. Um, so we've got a bit of a, um, a wide bottom, if you will, and a small top. So 44% of you coming in with a, um, a, a first-time match rate of 59% or less. Um, and uh, well done to the 8% who are in 91% uh, match rate or more. So congratulations to you. Uh, interesting results. Back to you, please, Judy. Excellent. Thanks much. Yes, um, when you're looking at these percentages, kind of my take on it is that it is very common for what we see out there. Um, when you look at the invoices that come in, you know, how many of them can be processed really without anything to be done to them. And when you're looking at that 59% or less, I don't want to leave the impression that if something is um, not matching 100% the first time that there's no benefits in automating, it just is a matter of kind of keying in with the organizational goals of being able to have 
purchasing and payables work a little bit more closely together so that your POs are aligning better with the invoices that are being received. And being able to measure those things is something that can be a key um, component in increasing that percentage of straight through processing. As we look at kind of best in class, they are finding that 85% of their invoices will match first time. So that's a pretty high number, but those are companies that have had a significant effort in that procure to pay space, really getting those two groups working together and looking at things as a team as opposed to competing forces. Um, industry average tends to be about 70%, and the laggards are, you know, 65% and less. So, you know, with that, we can see that there's a lot of area out there for opportunities to be able to have a higher percentages of invoices that match the first time, and some significant ways that you can improve upon those um, supplier-vendor relationships so that what you're getting on the invoice potentially matches, you know, what was on the purchase order, and having those conversations up front sometimes with the purchasing group and with the people that are doing the actual work to create that invoice to you um, can have some real benefits for the organization when you're looking at processing the AP documents. Um, with that, I want to go on to benchmark number four, which can fall right in line with you know, how many of those invoices that come in match the first time, and that is how timely are your payments. And this has to do with paying those invoices to terms with what's been agreed with your vendors. And with that, I'd like to go ahead, Susie, and take it so we can go ahead and move to question next question on the poll. Sure. Thank you, Julie. So what percentage of your invoices are paid to terms? Um, is it 90% or more, 80 to 89%, 70 to 79%? 60 to 69 percent or 59 percent or less. And I think this is quite an interesting um, KPI where there's been quite a lot of fluidity um, over the past few years because if you take your kind of cast your mind back to the time of the credit crunch um, and I think just before we were you know the, I think best in class then was really quite high um, and then the best in class dropped quite considerably um, because it was in the interest of a lot of the companies in order to kind of maintain their um, their liquidity, their cash flow, to actually try and stretch the terms quite a bit. So um, a, a lot of organizations were actually intentionally paying late. And then what happened after that was that um, through a pro the procurement process, contract terms were changed and redrafted. So terms that used to be 30 days became 45 days, 45 days became 60 days. So what we're seeing is actually there's a kind of a, we're dipping back we're kind of coming back up to um, shared services organisations actually now paying um, many more invoices to terms but that largely is because over the last few years those term rates have changed so it's sixty six percent of you responding so um, if you haven't already responded please do so closing the poll in three two one let's have a look at the results coming up on your screen now. So 30% um, of you uh, pay 90% of your invoices um, to two terms, and uh, 20 to shy of 20% of you, so 19% of you, coming in at 59% of your invoices paid to terms or less. Back to you, please, Julie. Thank you. Um, looking at this is really kind of interesting because of many of the things that you mentioned, Susie. Um, one of my customers is actually having this paying their invoices to terms as their primary goal this year. And with that, it's been really interesting as they've been kind of working backwards to try to find out why they can't pay things to terms sometimes and digging into those back-end processes that are causing things to be delayed. As we look at the industry metrics for kind of best in class, what we find is that 95% um, of the invoices that come into a best-in-class organization are being paid to terms, and other groups um, that are not best-in-class, so to speak, um, are paying about 72% of their invoices to terms, which, you know, even at 72%, that's a pretty high number compared to what I think we would have seen if we had taken the same poll um, a year or two ago. And really, this kind of is one of those indicators that 
your purchasing organization is able to utilize when they're going to their vendors and saying, hey, let's negotiate the contract, let's renegotiate the prices. And if you're showing consistently paying on time, you're at a much better standing to have that negotiating power than if you are you know, somebody who's consistently paying late. So it goes right back to kind of having that purchasing department working hand in hand with the department that's doing the payables and really understanding that it's a relationship that needs to work together along with the other departments to ensure that those things can happen. The next question that we're going to ask is kind of related to paying to terms, but it's really paying to terms and getting even a bigger benefit by taking discounts. And are you taking advantage of the discounts that are being offered by your vendors? I know that some organizations have a lot of discount potential and others don't have as much. But when you do have that option, are you taking advantage of it? And Susie, would you want to go ahead and start up the next question? Thank you, Julie. So again, coming up on your screen for benchmark number five, ladies and gentlemen. And as Julie mentioned there, really strongly linked to the payment on uh, time or the ability to pay on time stat that we were talking about in benchmark number four. Uh, what is your percentage of negotiated discounts uh, captured? So um, is it 50% uh, or more? Um, is it 40 to 49%? 30 to 39 percent, 20 to 29 percent, or 19 percent or less. And again, just to build on what Judy was talking about there, um, this might not have featured too much as a key AP benchmark um, kind of four or five years ago, uh, but really now it is, is an essential one, um, and it can actually govern how um, much you focus on the other KPIs as well, like payment on time. Uh, reason being because of this kind of perfect storm that we've currently got with um, enterprise companies, probably like the one that you're representing, having um, uh, your coffers are full in terms of um, enterprise companies that haven't been, haven't had their cash reserves so big for um, perhaps ever actually because they've taken investments out of particular funds. So their their reserves are very very high, and yet in the bank um, uh, interest rates are very very low. So in order to really get that working capital to sweat a bit for you, a lot of companies are really focusing on offering discounts to um, uh, the suppliers and um, or asking their suppliers to discount rather um, so that they'll pay early because you've got the cash reserves in order to take a little bit of a discount back from your, from your supplier. And that really is making your capital work for you quite a bit. And there's a big focus on working capital. Um, and dynamic discounting, working capital management, dynamic discounting right now. And it's a window of opportunity because of all these statistics that are lending themselves really well to this kind of setup. Um, your suppliers need the cash um, and you can provide them with the cash early. They're not getting cash on the whole from the banks. And the cash that's sitting in your bank account really isn't attracting a, an, an, a, a good or healthy interest rate. So, and it's a, a window which is closing over time. So. I don't know if um, this is going to be a big talking point in, say, 24 months' time. Um, so we have 54% of you responding to that. So closing the poll in 3, 2, 1. Uh, let's have a look at the results. 56 closing there. Um, so coming up on your screen, um, an interesting shaped uh, response, really, with 43% uh, of you saying um, that you capture 50% or more of the negotiated um, discounts. So so um, very positive results there. Um, and then coming in with about 40% of you, 39% indeed, with capturing only 19% only, um, of the negotiated discounts. Back to you, Julie. Thank you. Um, yeah, this, this is an interesting result because it's so heavily weighted at the top and at the bottom and then kind of in the middle. Um, there's just very little room. So it sounds like what we're seeing in our group anyway today is that, you know, there's a significant over half um, of the respondents are capturing about, or I should say, about half of the organizations are capturing about half of the discounts, which is great for the percent that you're able to capture. And it also shows that, um, you know, there's not a lot of organizations out there that are taking things and 
taking those discounts maybe when they're not deserved. The bottom portion is rather large in that as far as the um, percentage that you're looking at, you know, they don't have as much discounts that you're taking, and that shows probably aligned with the areas where you could go ahead and improve the process to be able to pay closer to terms and be able to have more documents processed by a single individual in your organization. As we move to kind of taking a look at the best in class, um, it would be interesting to note that only 31% of those are taking the negotiated discounts that are available to them and that the industry average is 24 and laggards are 15. So as you're looking at this, really there's a pretty significant portion of our audience that's capturing you know, best in class plus um, discounts that are available to them, which is great to see. And there is another point to be discussed, I guess, in regards to this, which is interesting, which has to do with you know, organizations that have made the decision to take discounts whether or not they're truly entitled to them. And we don't have a poll question related to that, but it is something that has been having quite a bit of conversation, I know, in the different organizations that I'm involved with because there are some companies out there that feel that, you know, if there has been a negotiated discount, um, they're going to try to take advantage of it regardless of if it's truly within the term that that discount was able to be truly taken. and what is that going to do to the vendor-supplier um, relationship as far as the next time that those contracts come due or the next time that you know pricing is being reviewed? So is that something that is truly helping the organization or is it something that you might be taking advantage of the situation a little bit if you're an organization that's looking to do that? And from a long-term perspective, is that something that makes sense to continue and some organizations are coming back with kind of a resounding yes and some organizations are you know, truly living by the terms that were negotiated and instead looking to figure out ways to improve their processes so that they can start to take advantage of higher and higher percentages of those discounts. Um, as we move into the next topic, we're going to talk about kind of the number of suppliers that are in your universe. and um, an interesting thing that is coming to fruition as we're working with our customers more and more is organizations really trying to do vendor rationalization and having less vendor relationships that they need to maintain to be able to do business. And there's a significant amount of work around each of those vendors that they need to maintain in their system as well as all of the different relationships that need to take place from both a payment perspective and a purchasing perspective and being able to kind of have greater buying power with those organizations because you are, you know, having significant bandwidth of documents, I'm sorry, significant bandwidth of items that are being purchased from those different suppliers. So with that, we're going to look at, you know, number six here. And Susie, would you like to go ahead and kick off the question? Thanks, Julie. So um, what is your number of suppliers per 10,000 invoices? Um, so is it less than 50? Is it 51 to 150, 151 to 300, 301 to 500, or is it 501 or more? And again, just to build on some of Julie's comments there as you're responding, we're currently at 21% of you responding, so if you haven't done so, Please do so. Um, so, of course, there's the, the kind of purchasing power that you can um, really leverage if uh, the number of suppliers that you've got, indeed, in each category is smaller. Um, so you're channeling all of your spend in a certain category to three suppliers, you're going to be able to leverage more opportunities than if you channel it through 17 suppliers. Also, I think um, a lot of the successes that you have from a process compliancy and a, an automation perspective in accounts payable are very reliant on your suppliers. So the more suppliers you have to manage, perhaps the question could be, is um, uh, are you opening up um, more risk of process compliancy and adoption of technology, for example, if you have um, more suppliers than you need? So if you've got a, a smaller um, supplier base to manage, uh, getting them to really adopt the purchase order process and getting them to really adopt the kind of um, AP automation uh, process that you might be wanting to apply to your 
accounts payable process, it's going to be uh, it's going to be a, an easier project to manage. We're only at forty nine percent, so um, this is a, an interesting one. We've uh, we only started using this KPI very recently. Um, so uh, please, if you haven't responded, please do so. Closing the poll in three, two, one. We were at forty nine percent. I did think that this one would be um, the uh, the one that wasn't responded to as highly as the others uh, because it is new. And I'll just urge you to. Um, to go and find this number, go and do the calculation, um, if you will, of um, this particular KPI. So what have we got here? We've got, uh, interestingly, we've got 14% uh, of you coming in at less than 50 suppliers per 10,000 invoices. So that really is, in, in um, our account of all things supplier base, it's, um, it's uh, the best practice here, the, sorry, the, the, the best in class here. Um, and then 14% of you coming in at 501 or more suppliers per 10,000. Back to you, please, Julie. Great, thank you. When you're looking at this, I, I definitely agree with what you mentioned, Susie. And it's interesting to see kind of that there's only 28% you know, that are upper in the upper two stratas and that the rest of the organizations are in the lower group. But it's nice to see that there's only 14% that are in the 501 plus. And just as you mentioned, you know, getting all of those different suppliers aligned and following the different um, questions and things that you're trying to ask of your suppliers to be able to take advantage of things is an interesting um, kind of process that it's really affecting the procurement side, I think, much more so than the payment side. But that procurement side, obviously, is where everything starts. And as they're working through those vendor rationalizations, it's something that is able to um, have a positive impact on the payable side if you have a smaller population of suppliers that you need to work with to um, have those invoices paid. As we move onwards, we're going to go ahead and look at the next item, which is how much automation has already been implemented. And this is kind of benchmark number seven. There's not a standard KPI for this. It's kind of more of a context question as well. But as we look at it, I'd like to go ahead and kick it over to you, Susie, so we can go ahead with the next poll question. Sure. Thank you very much. So coming up on your screen now, and uh, we will just um, explain to you what we mean here by high, medium, and low. So just take a moment, if you will. But where, where do you see yourself on the path to automation for AP process? So high, i.e., significant use of imaging or electronic invoicing, automated workflow. Uh, you're quite kind of near to paperless T&E. Uh, you've got electronic payments being made use of cards, and uh, possibly some um, invoice uh, data extraction, et cetera, can help me there. Um, medium, some use of scanning and filing, but no true automation prior to posting. Uh, still have to deal with um, manual paper-based processing. Or low, you're mainly in a, a mostly paper-based uh, and manual um, process and environment. 61% of you responded, um, if you haven't already done so. Uh, please do so close in the poll in three, two, one. Let's have a look at the results coming up on your screen now. So as you can see here, 30% uh, of you rate yourselves of high, as high. So congratulations to you. And 51% coming in as medium, 19% as low. Over to you, please, Julie. Great. Thank you. And I'm actually going to go ahead and look at this as well as kind of that next slide when you look at the two numbers and compare them side by side. Um, really, I think our poll kind of ties out almost to where this uh, metric is sitting as far as kind of what organizations have reported in other scenarios where companies are looking at, you know, really the bulk of companies have done some things but haven't taken it to the nth degree. And then there's, you know, about a third of organizations that really are still at the early stages of looking at automating your process. And kind of with that mindset, I want to go ahead and move to the next portion because I know that we're running a little bit tight on time. And that's just kind of those success factors and looking at three things that can really help to improve your KPIs as you're looking at your projects. And with that, the three things that we have as kind of the key items are being able to choose those appropriate KPIs, as we had mentioned, doing a good job of managing that change that you're implementing in your organization to improve those KPIs, and being able to have a global service owner. That first item, as far as choosing those appropriate KPIs, not going to spend a lot of time on it because we did talk about it a little bit earlier, 
but really aligning them with your strategic goals of your organization, making sure that the data you're able to get and measure is accurate and easily accessible, I would like to add to that. And then using kind of those industry metrics that are available out there in the world for management buy-in when you're starting to look at justifying the cost of, an or of a change project or you're looking at justifying putting some automation in place. There's a ton of research out there and there's a lot of information out there that can really help you as you're building your business case and um, to make those projects come to reality as opposed to something that's kind of been sitting on the shelf and talked about for a long time but not able to move to the actual implementation step. As we move to the next success criteria, I would go ahead and talk a little bit about change management. And just at a very high level, I just cannot stress enough how closely your project success is directly tied to the level of acceptance that the project has within the organization. And that's at all levels of the organization, not just the top, not just the users, but every level in the organization really needs to get behind that project and really embrace it and understand why it's being done and how each person can affect the positive or negative outcome of that um, project that's being done to have those ultimately impact on those KPIs. So when you're looking at it from a sponsorship and support standpoint, both upper management and the processing team need to be involved as well as the approvers and anybody else that's involved in the process. And really when it comes to user input, we encourage suggestions early and often as you're looking at these projects and trying to get them into the hands of the users and allowing them to make suggestions rather than you know coming in, doing a big fanfare of a kickoff and then coming back six months later and saying, here's what we built and seeing if it aligns with kind of what the vision of the users were. So we really find that by having those users have input throughout the process, you're able to have a project that comes off much more successfully and having change management as a part of that can really help out um, kind of from a global enterprise perspective, having a positive success on your processes, which then lead to, lead to improving KPIs. The third item that we wanted to talk about is regarding kind of the global service owner. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you, Susie, to talk about that a little bit. Thank you, um, Julie. So uh, you'll probably be aware of the fact that there's been a bit of a, a shift, um, been a big focus on getting a global process owner within purchase to pay and various other end-to-end -end processes within um, shared services. And, and that's been a big focus over the last kind of three or four years. And now there is very much the emergence of the global service owner Normally, the process owners report into the service owner, and the service owner is really uh, very well connected uh, with the business to understand the, the key business needs, meeting with very senior people in the business to understand that the service that's being provided, which is supported by the process, supported by the, the, um, the technology that you've got, supported by the people that you've got in finance and shared services and accounts payable, is really, really plugging in to where the company wants to be in 12 months' time. So that really is the responsibility of the global service owner. So we're seeing an emergence of this, um, this job title and this individual. Uh, so and it really represents a kind of a shift from um, um, just looking at process in isolation to focusing on service delivery and then making sure that the process really kind of supports that service delivery that helps the business um, meet its intentions within the next kind of 12 months or so. Um, so what we're also seeing is that the service owner is now responsible for the customer satisfaction. They, they are commissioned on it, they're bonused on it, um, and sometimes to quite a, um, a you know, third of their salary might be dependent on the customer satisfaction rate. And also they'll be owning the, uh, the KPIs and reporting the KPIs to the business. So um, introducing this into your, into your plans as well can have quite a, a significant impact. Back to you please, Julie. Excellent. Um, last item that we had as kind of one of our bullet points that we wanted to make sure and talk about was just a case study from one of our customers that we have. And with that, we have a chemical company that's headquartered here in the States, and they really had a lot of different mixed processes around the globe. They were in the middle of moving to a shared service model that was actually going to be over in um, Eastern Europe, and they were looking for a solution that was in the cloud to allow for growth worldwide usage, but not having to have a lot of IT resources necessarily dedicated to it on a daily basis. And as they were looking at different solutions, um, they considered a number of different things, but they really tried to focus on the cloud so that 
they were able to get the automation for the AP solution. And then also they knew that they had some additional processes that they wanted to take a look at down the road. And getting those resources available from an IT perspective, they knew for AP projects would be challenging, but then to grow those things down the road would even be a bigger challenge to be able to look at additional things that they were trying to automate from a shared service center standpoint. So um, we ended up working with them, and they've been live for a while now. And as far as kind of the results that they've been able to see have been pretty remarkable. They've been able to get this single solution to have um, kind of a worldwide presence, but it can be done in a way that they can go ahead and have the desktop be customized to the country that the user is in, whether that user be somebody who's an approver or somebody that's you know, truly just um, working on the invoices on a day-to-day -day perspective. And it's available as far as languages go in both data extraction and for the user fields that are on the form. The reporting capabilities are allowing them to really kind of take ownership of those KPIs that we've been talking about and get good information. So if they were asked to you know, bring some of this information to meetings, some of it's available from within the solution, some of it from within their ERP, but they're able to get to that data. And one of their biggest issues that they had was really kind of this AP black hole where things were coming in and they didn't know about them necessarily until they were received at the point where it was ready to be entered for payment as opposed to the point where the invoice came in and it was being you know, processed through the approval process, whether it was being handed around physically or if it was being sent via email. Either way, the AP department didn't know that it was out there in the universe and it was very difficult for them to handle a lot of the calls that would come in from vendors and also to manage kind of what they knew was coming down the pike as far as workload and as far as the dollars involved for paying. The other item that they found was that their amount of time that it took to process from the receipt to the release of payment has been controlled significantly, which has allowed them to control their cash flow and improve their rating, rating with their vendors so that they can then go back and negotiate some of those contracts. And um, wanted to you know, touch on this, but I know that as far as kind of the timeline goes, we want to make sure that we get to that final point of being able to have some Q&A and also um, talk about a couple other things. So with that, um, love to kind of move to that next portion as we're getting ready to wrap up here. Uh, Susie? Thank you very much. So we do have a number of questions from the floor, and uh, we are a bit limited on time. Um, but um, some some questions coming through. Um, I'm going to take some of them, if that's okay. We've got um, some of you have been asking what's the best source for information um, for benchmarking. You've seen that there have been a number of sources that uh, Esker has been calling on here. Um, key source has been um, APQC. Uh, they're very strong, especially in the North American market. Uh, so that's a good one, um, um, and you're very welcome to email me if you want to be put in contact with them. Um, and there's also Hackett, um, they have a good um, database as well, but also Aberdeen provides some interesting um, sources there too, or that's an interesting source. Um, and also another question which I'm, I'm going to take was, what was the benchmark info for the number of invoice, number of suppliers per 10,000 invoices? That's not formally gathered, so ShareServiceLink.com has just introduced that recently. So um, we, there's not actually a kind of an industry metric for that as yet, um, because as I say, it's, it's quite a, a new one. Um, I'll put this to you, um, we only really do have time for two kind of brief responses here, if I may, Julie, but um, what, what are you, what, um, as far as kind of the trends in AP process improvement, um, what can we expect in the next kind of one to three? years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say as far as kind of the things that we're seeing most frequently are, you know, increasing use of um, automation in the solution and that companies are really looking to automate um, as much as possible. But when we talk about automation, they're looking at everything from um, a perspective of how do we get everything into one place so we have full visibility to it because that black hole is definitely an issue. And just from a way that they're delivering the um, improvements to the organization, really kind of that move to the cloud that we alluded to is a huge one that we're seeing because 
organizations do not want to invest a ton of money into servers and software anymore, which, you know, I know that decision isn't always made at the level of the um, AP department, but when you look at ways that you're able to see AP departments get things in quickly and start to get some positive outcomes quickly, a lot of times you find that they're able to do that by using solutions that are out there as a service as opposed to having to make an investment in a, you know, a software itself. Okay, um, thank you. Also, there's been a question about any KPIs um, suggested which uh, re regarding improvement in time taken by the customer for approving the invoice, um, i.e. where there is a split of responsibility between the customer and the shared services organization. Um, Julie, do you have anything to add on that, or shall I take that, that, that particular question? Um, I have just a couple points on that in that we have worked with organizations that have had everything from, you know, a very rigid approval hierarchy that can be up to seven, sometimes eight levels. And then we also have some organizations where the approval hierarchy is very flat and that they're able to get things through very quickly because they take it, you know, to the highest level very quickly. And I think that the biggest things that we're seeing is that you know, actually having the approval hierarchy be someplace that it can be accessed so that there's less questions about it and having it be something where there are less approvers required so that you can move things through more quickly and then also having that be able to be available, you know, in a variety of ways for approval from everything from, you know, email workflow to things that you can have apps available and things like that so that people that are approvers can get them approved more quickly. And Susie, and those are the things I'm seeing. What are you running into? Well, um, I'd love to go into it, but unfortunately we have run out of time. So uh, oh, there yeah. were a, a lot of questions um, that came through. Um, so what I'm going to ask is for Julie uh, to come back to you on the 10 or so questions that we weren't able to, to um, handle for you because we are unfortunately out of time. Um, so Julie May, thank you so much uh, for the input there. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to bring your, to your attention, we have um, 10 keys to process excellence coming up in London in September and of course we have um, uh, more exciting webinars coming up for you in the next three weeks um, in July so make sure that those are in your diary because they will absolutely help you with your KPI improvement so for the time being thank you very much for your uh, attention and look forward to welcoming you next time goodbye <laughs>